Hi everybody, my name is Andras Pop, and I'm going to be talking about Red Blue Pebble Games, presenting a joint work with Roger Wattenhofer. The goal of this talk is to model how a computation works. So if you have an expression like this to compute, then you can model this as a directed acyclic graph, where the source nodes correspond to the inputs of the computation, and the sync nodes correspond to the final outputs. So for example, in this case, you first have to add x and y, then do a small computation on this with the value of z, then you again need the value of y, and again the value of z, and so on. And the approach of Pebble games is to use so-called pebbles to mark values which have already been computed. And then given these two values, you can compute the next value, that is also place a pebble on that node. And in particular, red-blue pebble games model this computation in a two-level memory hierarchy. So you have two kinds of pebbles. Red pebbles correspond to a faster memory, for example, cache, whereas blue pebbles correspond to slow memory, for example, RAM. And you mark these nodes according to where the corresponding values are saved. So given a computational DAG, the goal of the red-blue pebble game is to place a pebble of any color on the sync nodes of this DAG. And we can achieve this by a sequence of the following steps. First of all, we can always replace a blue pebble by a red pebble, uh, that is, simply move a value to cache. So for example, if we have these pebbles on the DAG currently, we can just take this blue pebble and replace it by a red one. In a very similar fashion, we can also replace a red pebble by a blue one. So for example, take this red pebble and put a blue one here instead. Also, if a node already has a red pebble in all of its inputs, for example, this node, then we can compute this node, that is, also place a red pebble on this node. And finally, at any point, we can remove a pebble of any color from the DAG. So, for example, take this pebble and simply remove it from this node. And in Red Blue Pebble games, we assume that the first two operations, the so-called transfer operations, have a cost of 1, while the last two operations are essentially free. Which is maybe surprising, but not that unrealistic, because in practice, for example, computing a new value from values in cache usually takes a much smaller magnitude of time than moving a value between cache and RAM, for example. Furthermore, in practice, we usually only have a limited amount of fast memory. So to model this, we also introduce a further constraint that at any point in time, there can be at most R red pebbles on the DAG, which allows us to model the time memory trade-off. So for example, if we have R equals three, uh, three units of fast memory, then we can compute this upper node, but then when we want to compute this lower node, we don't have any more red pebbles left. So we need to transfer the upper node to slow memory, place a blue pebble on it at a cost of one, and only then can we compute this lower node. And after this point, we can just delete the input values because they are not needed anymore, and then we need to bring this upper node back from slow memory at another cost of one, and then we can finish the computation uh, with a total cost of 2. Whereas if we had r equals 4, then we can just compute both nodes, because it all fits into fast memory, then delete the inputs, and then finish the computation without having any cost at all. So we refer to the setting introduced so far as the base model of pebbling, but related work has also looked into different variations of this problem. For example, note that in the space model, you can have recomputations. That is, you can just delete the red pebble from a node and then compute it back there without having to transfer it to slow memory in the meantime. And one variant is the so-called one-shot model, where this is banned by saying that the computation operation can only be invoked on each node once. Or another variant is the so-called nodal model, where the deletion operation is not allowed meaning that if you run out of red pebbles, you will have to save your values in the slow memory. And we believe the most realistic variant is a so-called compost model, where instead of assigning a cost of zero to computations, we assign a small constant of silent cost to them, which is realistic in the sense that computations now do incur some cost, even if this cost is much less than the cost of transfer operations. 
So we can summarize these different model variants by showing the cost of operations in a table. In particular, the transfer operations have a cost of 1 in each of these model variants. In the base model, the other two operations have a cost of 0. In one shot, computation is free for the first time and then cannot be executed afterwards. In nodal, it's a deletion operation that cannot be executed. And in comp cost, the computation step has a small constant cost of epsilon. And we can also have other minor variations in the problem definition. Uh, for example, instead of source nodes being computable, we can say that they explicitly have to be loaded from slow memory, or that outputs explicitly have to be written to slow memory, or that we can only have a few input nodes. But one can show that these minor changes actually do not matter for our results. So let's look at some basic properties of this pebbling problem. First of all, if we denote the maximum in degree in the DAG by delta, then we can note that if r is less than delta plus 1, then such a pebbling is not possible at all, simply because when computing the max degree node, you need one red pebble on the actual node and delta red pebbles on its inputs. So from now on, we always assume that r is at least delta plus 1, and actually this is a sufficient condition to always have a pebbling. Uh, you can just take a topological ordering of the nodes of the DAG as a computation order, and in the next step, you can always just free delta plus 1 arbitrary red pebbles by sending those values into slow memory. Then you can move delta of these red pebbles to the inputs and do the computation. And since this has a cost of 2 delta plus 1 altogether, this also shows that the optimal cost of a pebbling can never be more than 2 delta plus 1 times n. So this already gives us an upper bound on the cost of pebbling in each of these models, and note that this is slightly higher in the ComCost model due to the extra cost of computations. And as for a lower bound, in the upper two models, it can very well happen that the cost of a pebbling is actually as low as zero, but we do have some lower bounds in the other two models. In Nodal, since we cannot delete any pebble, the final state will have a pebble on each node, and unless we have a very high number of red pebbles, this will mean that we essentially have to transfer all values to slow memory by the end. And in ComCost, since each node has to be computed, we also have a lower bound of epsilon times n. And in practice, delta is usually small or even a constant, so in these lower two models, these bounds are within a constant factor from each other. Uh, whereas in the upper two models, the upper and lower bounds can differ by a linear factor, so these two models are somewhat more interesting from a theoretical perspective. On the other hand, note that this is only the cost of the optimal pebbling, but the length of the optimal pebbling, that is, the number of steps it takes, is an entirely different story. For example, in the base model, since deletions and computations are free, it can actually happen that the optimal pebbling sequence consists of a very long, even super polynomially long, sequence of deletions and recomputations, but it still has no cost at all because it does not use any transfer operations. And in contrast to this, in the other models, the introduced changes ensure in one way or another that such a very long sequence of deletions and recomputations is not possible, or at least suboptimal. So in these other variants, uh, the optimal pebbling only lasts for delta times n steps. And this also means that the problem is in NP in these alternative models, but it is not in NP in the base model, unless NP equals P space. So when showing our results, we are mostly going to focus on the one-shot model, since that is the one which is both in NP and has a potentially large factor of difference between the upper and lower bounds, but most of our results can also be adapted to the remaining models. So in the general setting, we have an input DAG and a fixed amount of red pebbles available, and our goal is to find the pebbling that pebbles this DAG with the minimal possible cost. And as for our results, we first show that this problem is NP-hard in all of these models. Uh, we point out that the NP-hardness of red pebbling has already been shown before in some of the models, but we still include this proof because it's much simpler than the previous proof and easier to carry over to the remaining models. And given that this is a hard problem with a relevant application, our next question is whether it can be solved efficiently in practice, and we also provide some negative results in that direction. Uh, first, through a reduction from vertex cover, we show that in the one-shot model, 
the best bubbling cannot be approximated to better than a two factor if the unique games conjecture holds. And on the other hand, we analyzed the greedy algorithm, which is a natural candidate for a heuristic to this problem, and we showed that it can return solutions which are significantly worse than the optimal one. So our proof of MP hardness is based on a reduction to the Hamiltonian pass problem, and let us just outline the base idea of this proof. So for each vertex of the original graph, we create a so-called input group of R-1 nodes in our computational DAG, which are all inputs of a specific target node. And this means that in order to compute one of these target nodes, we require all the R available red pebbles, uh, R-1 on the inputs and 1 on the target, which simplifies the analysis a lot because we do not have to discuss which red pebbles to use or where the remaining red pebbles are in the DAG. So we encode the structure of the original graph in the following way. If two vertices of the graph are not adjacent, then the corresponding input groups will simply be two disjoint input groups. So after visiting one of them, we have to turn the target node blue, and also all the inputs blue if they are ever needed again, since they cannot be recomputed in the one-shot model. And then we can visit the input group of the other vertex and compute the target node. On the other hand, if the two vertices are adjacent, then what we do is we merge a node of these two input groups so they have a small intersection. So now if one input group is visited first, then when proceeding to visit the other input group, we now have a slightly smaller cost for this transition because we do not have to execute a transfer operation on this single intersection node. Essentially, a pebbling in this DAG will mean that we have to visit all the input groups in some order, which corresponds to a permutation of the vertices of the original graph. And we can define the allowed cost such that the pebbling with such a cost only exists if each pair of vertices in this permutation was adjacent. Uh, that is, if we had a Hamiltonian path in the original graph. For the unapproximability result, we provide the reduction to the vertex cover problem in a very similar fashion. But this time we create two different input groups for each vertex, a so-called first level and second level input group. And also the first level group will have more than one target node, but that does not really have any major effect. So the main idea is that we create a very large intersection between these two groups, so that most of the nodes in the two groups are common, so it looks more like something like this. But we will still use this double line notation to show that the two groups are almost the same. And the main concept of the vertex cover reduction is that when two vertices are adjacent in the original graph, then we take a target node of the first level group of one vertex and place it in the second level group corresponding to the other vertex. And we do this in both directions. Uh, recall that first and second level groups are almost the same, which means that in an efficient pebbling after visiting the first level group of a vertex, it would be very beneficial to immediately continue with the second level group, since then we do not have to save these nodes and reload them later, which spares a lot of cost. So we can just compute these common nodes, uh, visit both groups, and then delete them at practically no cost. However, since this second level group contains a target node of this group, this means that we can only do this if the first level group of the adjacent node has already been visited before and this target node is computed and saved in slow memory. So in order to do this, we first have to visit the first level group of the lower vertex, uh, save it in slow memory since it is still needed later, then visit the two groups of the upper vertex consecutively, and then, in order to visit the second level group of the lower vertex, we have to reload these nodes from slow memory at a large cost. So this means that from every pair of adjacent vertices, we can only have these two level visits consecutively for one of them, and the other one will induce a large cost. This will mean that the best strategy is to find the large independent set in the original graph and visit it, these vertices consecutively, and then the total cost will essentially be proportional to the size of the remaining vertex cover where the visits are non-consecutive, and we want to minimize the size of this vertex cover. And since vertex cover is not approximable to a better than two factor, if we accept the unique games conjecture, then this allows us to also show that the best bubbling is also not approximable to such a factor. Finally, 
we briefly look at the heuristic approach where the next node to compute is always selected by a greedy rule. And there are multiple natural ways to define such a greedy algorithm, but since our construction will have the same in degree for each node, uh, these different definitions will coincide in our case, so our result will hold for all of them. So let's just consider a setting where in the next step, we always want to compute the previously uncomputed node and we always select the one which has the highest number of red pebbles on its inputs already. To show the suboptimality of this approach, we will have a construction where the input groups are aligned along a grid, as shown in the slide. And as before, we will have dependencies between the input groups, shown by the arrows. That is, a target node of one group is included in another group to ensure that the first group has to be visited before the second one. And once again, we create very large intersections of common nodes between the groups. So along each diagonal, the groups are essentially consisting of the same nodes, plus a few distinct extra nodes. So the optimal behavior in this setting is to visit the groups in the diagonals consecutively. Uh, for example, we begin with this group, and then we move all the way through this diagonal, and then we continue with this one. And note that in this ordering, by the time we reach a specific group, the group below it has already been visited, so the dependencies are not a problem in this case. And then in each diagonal, we can just compute these common nodes of the diagonal, keep them in cache while visiting the diagonal, and then delete them in the end. So the common nodes will induce no cost in this optimal ordering. However, we can easily mislead a greedy heuristic such that it begins with this group, and then here it would be very beneficial to move up along the diagonal to this group, but the greedy algorithm cannot do this because it has a dependency on the group below, so some of the nodes in this upper group are not even computed yet. Then we lead the greedy algorithm to this group, where it again cannot go up along the diagonal since this group is not yet computed, so it has to go up instead. And altogether, we can ensure that the greedy algorithm follows this path through the grid. And in each point of the path, it would rather go up along the diagonal instead, but this is not possible because the other groups in the diagonal are still not available at this point. So with this ordering, the greedy algorithm will essentially have to take the common nodes in each diagonal and save and reload them from slow memory many, many times, which altogether gives almost a linear factor difference between the cost of the greedy method and the optimum. So this summarizes the base ideas of our constructions in the one-shot model, and most of these techniques can be carried over to the remaining models with minor modifications. Uh, for example, we have to account for the fact that there are some extra costs in nodal models. Uh, for example, in nodal, you cannot delete a value after its last use, so you have to transfer it to slow memory, and in compost, computations have an explicit extra cost. And besides this, we also have to disable recomputations in the models that allow recomputations, because this could lead to a different behavior, and we can design a specific gadget explicitly to achieve this task. And besides adapting our proofs to other model variants, another interesting question is what happens when we restrict the in-degree in our DAX to a constant? Because computational DAX in practice usually only have a very small in-degree, and so many previous works have also assumed that delta is at most a constant. Fortunately, we can show that our hardness results still hold in this restricted case, and the base idea for this is to replace our input groups in the construction by a more sophisticated gadget. So recall that an input group essentially forces us to place all the R red pebbles in the group and its target at a specific point. So what we do is we take away this target node and instead add a layer of further nodes, then another similar layer, and so on, H layers for some parameter H. And we also increase the number of available red pebbles by one, so it will be R plus one in terms of the original R. And for this gadget, if we have a red pebble in each of the input nodes, then we can use the remaining two red pebbles to pebble the gadget with no cost at all. We can just compute this node, then compute this one, delete this one since it's not needed anymore, then compute this one, delete this one, and so on. The whole pebbling does not induce any cost at all. On the other hand, if we have strictly less than r-1 red pebbles in the input group at every point in time, 
then we constantly have to move these red pebbles around when we reach a node that does not have a red pebble on its inputs. So the resulting cost will be proportional to the length h. So while this gadget has constant in degree, it essentially achieves the same goal as the original input group. It practically forces us to place all the available red pebbles into the gadget in any reasonable pebbling, otherwise the cost becomes very high. So replacing our original input groups by copies of this gadget allows us to generalize our results to the constant in degree case. So of course this still leaves many open questions in the area, with the most prominent one being whether we can solve these problems efficiently in practice. And this is still very well possible because practical computational DAGs might have some special structure or special property besides a small degree that might make the problem much easier in practice than in the general case. So this is certainly a promising direction for future work. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions in the Q&A session.